I don't think there's such a thing as an underworld, you know what I mean? It's just, um... Villains, and, and, and villains, there's no... There's no door you go into and there's another world. When you talk, in our language, when you say, I was on the pavement in them days, what it meant was security robberies. I mean, it meant bank robberies, anything like that. You've got, a, you know, you've got, you know, 50 or 60 on the ground and, and you're cutting out between each other. Of course, that's very exciting, isn't it? You wouldn't think it is? <laughs> I know you would. And I heard a couple of bangs. And Cooney was dead. Ambrose had one in his stomach. If you pull a gun on me, you're going to fight a life out of me. Right? And you put it back in your pocket. Well, I know what I've got to do with you tomorrow now, don't I? They were both crazy bastards, you know what I mean? It wasn't just one doing all the villain and one not. I mean, you know, fear both of them. So when they come at you, they'd come together. Everything they did, they did together. Working didn't become a way of life. I mean, I was taught from an early age that crime didn't pay, but the hours were good. I suppose if you look at uh, taking of life, right, and any life can't be justified, but it was in a war even. But it's only justified if it's a really bad person. I mean, you hate someone enough, you want to kill him, don't you? I mean, uh, until you've hated, do you know what I mean? You, you never know what hatred is. It's like, in my, in my belief, they say there's a fine line between love and hate. Well, you know, many times I've said, uh, how many girls has a man told he loves? I mean, <laughs> you can't count them, can you? How many times fellas have said that to women? How many times have you fellas said to someone, I hate him, I hate him, I hate him, I hate that fella, I hate that bloke, I hate this one. Right? Don't hate him. And maybe, now, I said that, and one day I hated someone. He was a copper, fitted me up. And I could have truly put him on the floor, got a knife out and cut his heart out and stuck it in his mouth. That's how much I hated him. Then I realised I never hated anybody else. Do you know what I mean? Then I thought to myself, well, if that feeling of hatred that I had, then I've never loved anybody either. Because I've never had that strength of feeling. So, of course, is it justified in taking the life? I'd have felt justified in taking his life. So when you say good killings and bad killings, it's a good killing if, if, if you feel you want to be rid of him. Yeah. I was, brought, I was brought up in, uh, originally in uh, Angel Islington. And then uh, just after the war. And then I suppose it would have, I was about 14, I think, so now. 14, 15. I moved out to, um, to Carl Shorten. And, uh, then I spent the rest of my time there. But I used to keep going back to North London uh, to see my pals up there. Most of the kids after the war, you, you're coming from sort of uh, where we came from, North London, Angel. Everyone, w w when you say petty crime, was all involved in some petty crime. Well, I wouldn't call it petty crime, really, then. If you was out doing, like, um, uh, breaking in and 
robbing cigarette wholesalers and um, doing things like that's not petty crime, is it? You know what I mean? Shoplifting is really petty crime, which we did when we were school kids. That type of thing, like, you know, we were shoplifting as kids. But you graduated into something else. And, um, it wasn't a question, wasn't on no blame to your parents, it was just the way things were in them days, the people we mixed with. You know. It became a way of life, um, working didn't become a way of life. I mean, I was taught from an early age that crime didn't pay, but the hours were good. So, um, I suppose that's what it is. You know, we don't, um, you just fall in line the way things are. Had a few robberies that on the pavement, yeah. It meant working on the pavement didn't mean uh, the way a lot of people was, if they don't understand, might take on the pavement as being a mugger or nicking Rolex watches, nothing like that. When you talk in our language, when you say, I was on the pavement in them days, what it meant was security robberies. I mean, it meant bank robberies, anything like that. What it meant was wage snatching, really. But it's what on the pavement meant. It still does to us now. I remember once, they told us there was a safe there, it was probably about a four, three or four foot high. When we got on the place, it was eight foot high. Well, then you knew, when you're blowing the gel night, you knew that you'd have to put enough in that safe, in that door, to, as a bomb, put a bomb in it and blow the door right off, like, you know, that's what we used to do. But, um, he was right out of the way of it, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, we never used, used to get people knew what they was doing not when you were there in the gel I mean, people who'd done that job, it was a profession in itself. I mean, in them days, there was people like, I'll say, old Georgie Madsen, he's dead now. He was about the best man at it. And literally, what you would do is he would plug the jelly around the keel, the jelly night in there, and then put some putty plasticine around it, hold it in, to put in his uh, detonator. And the other end of it, you'd have like, um, he'd have like a plug, uh, uh, take the light bulb out, plug it in there. And then as soon as you switch the light on, bang, you go. So you'd hide out in the other room, get right out of the way, switch the light down, bang, it was off. And, um, like people used to say to me now, like, you know, oh, the noise that you, but you'd muffle it with carpets and uh, whatever you had in there. And, you know, a lot of people, as I was saying to Peter, my old man said to me when I was a kid, like Joe, he said, what do people do when they hear a bang? And I'll ask you that. What do you do when you're, you're laying in bed and you hear bang? What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You wait for the second bang. And if there's no second bang, you turn over and go to sleep. Any noise you hear, nine times out of ten, people go, what's that noise? And instead of jumping that bed, they're waiting for the next noise. And if there's not a second noise, oh, wasn't anything, you go back to sleep. So that's after time. If you made that one bang, then you stop for a while, don't move. Make for you sweet, you know what I mean? Then you go bang and get your money out of the safe. That's how that used to work with your kids. A man who went and robbed somebody of their watch or of their wallet, he was a no good bastard. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't have nothing to do with someone like that. Nothing at all. I mean, we was all proud of what we did. You know what I mean? When they would discuss robberies with each other. No one went out like robbing people on the streets. Any any plan you go into, you know, whether it was a robbery or what it was, and, and to see it be successful at the end of the day, of course that give you a lift. It's good to see that, you know what I mean? Better than going to work, you know, sweeping the factory floor. Had to be, didn't it? <laughs>
Most of it's exciting when you get caught though. Then the excitement wears off very quick. <laughs> I'd much better earn a bag of money than, 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 than getting a, a, a check for the, for the bank. It, it's very exciting when you're cutting up the money, yeah. You've got, a, you know, you've got, you know, 50 or 60 or 100 grand in it and, and you're cutting up between each other. Of course, that's very exciting, isn't it? You wouldn't think it is? <laughs> I know you would. John went to the school down the road from me. We're just in the same area. We knew of each other and we were pals, you know. Well, you had, what, six brothers, didn't you? Billy, Jimmy, and you had John, and you had uh, Ron, Georgie, Roy. And I said they all had the same code. And they were six, no, like, they was like a firm in their wasn't they? Oh, you'd be in more trouble if you come up against them than you would against the twins, yeah, in them days, yeah. Well, this is with the area, all round here, where I'd say, uh, where me, Johnny and his brothers would be. This was our plot, really. This is the area that we hang around. More Mayfair. And up there would be so exciting. We went there sometimes, not so much, though. But we'd be mainly around here. And Mayfair and you know, everything drops around here. The upper market, as you would say. There's a crowd of us, yeah. It was like a football team. I mean, everybody did their job. But it wasn't different skills. But if one, one ain't put on his weight, you leave him out. Well, we didn't run the West End. We run what businesses we had in the West End. I mean, to say you run, you run the West End, there was lots of businesses there. We didn't run them, you know what I mean? Well, all we did, we had our interest in it. The Astor Club. What we're looking after, Bagatelle Club, and there was the colony. You know, we was getting a living out of them. So obviously, we'd be in there most nights of the week. We and we wouldn't be working on the door. In them days, you didn't have bouncers on the doors. You had a uniformed commissioner standing at the door, and if we was um, looking after that governor's interest, the owner's interest. We'd be inside the club, sitting down at a table, having a drink or a cup of coffee. We'd be standing around the door, like with evening suits and bow ties. So that was different. Then. This is Barclay Square, and we're coming down to where the um, where the Colony Club used to be. That was where George Ralph and the Americans had their place. And you know, Cellini had the casino down here. And uh, the Astor Club, I'll show you where that used to be. There was the Astor Club. With it. See what them table is outside? That was the door. That was the door, rather, to the Astor Club. Well, the Astor Club was drinking in cabaret. And if you read the craze books, that, that's the, where they was the night before they got nicked, yeah. Well, everybody used that. Who was there? Anybody. I mean, most of the chaps used that place. The Astor Club. That's where we are. And me, we used to look after that, me and John. If you've got 300 quid out of a club for Mike looking after it, 300 quid in the 60s was a lot of money. A week, wasn't it? But well, some of you were shared out amongst you, like you, you were. And, and then we had um, a casino, um, the Olympic Casino. Me and John used to look after that. Only because he wanted to put us in there, the owner. And we used to sit in there every night and get a few quid out of there. It was only because the man wanted us there. If he didn't want us there, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't have gone. He used to ask us to go there and look, up and look after him. When people tried to cheat in there, they'd tell us. I mean, we wasn't allowed to gamble. We wasn't, you know. I remember one night I went in there and... Uh, <coughs> to Lisa Ballas, the actor, I was gambling on the table and I'd gone skin. 
and Demetrius was in his office. He didn't he didn't see me gambling, right? And I was betting in like fifties and thirties and I'd done a few hundred quid, it was like money in them days, you know. And all of a sudden this geezer walks in behind me and this is a ballast. But now I'm down to like two quids on the box. You know what I mean? And he's leaned across the arm and he's half drunk, he's got a girl on his arm. And he puts down like a twenty pound chip in my box. I've got the two quid there. And I know the cards come up at night sixteen. And I said, No card. Then he said, Card. And I turned around and I said, No card. He said, Card. And I said, Look, mate, it's my box. So he went, Yeah, but I've got 20, 20 pounds on there. I said, I'm going to give a fuck with you, James Bond. You need James Bond film there, you know. And with an argument. And Dimitri came running out of the office. Oh, I didn't lose it, man. Not to gamble in. I said, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm losing. So he went, Okay, okay. And I'm losing about two or three hundred quid. He's picked up 50 quid, chips in, yeah, Joe, don't gamble. He, you know, he, didn't, he didn't want to have an argument, he's like, well, I nice, I've got 50 quid, and I can't gamble no more, like, you know. In the casinos, if someone knocks them for money, then we'd go out and get the debt in. But then we get a commission on their debt as well. We get paid extra. We'd never threaten anybody to, to get their money in. That was old fashioned, and it's just for the films. We'd ask people nicely, but the presence would be enough. Then we'd say to them, like, how do you intend to pay this debt? But you know, there was big debts. I mean, I remember we got we got some debt over the cherry broccoli, remember him? Made all the James Bond movies? Yeah. We went and got a debt off of him. That was for about 40 grand, but he got a bit, he, he tried to get a bit tough of us. He wouldn't see us, and eventually he did see us. And when he did, he had all his minders around him. But we said, what the fucking hell are they? We don't care about your minders. Then we went a different way with him. We owe you this, we owe this money, you've got to pay it. Well, the minders knew us. Do you know what I mean? And uh, they just didn't want to know. He paid. I think he paid the same day. Now, I can remember one night we were sitting in the, um, in the colony club, George Ross place. Right. And we were in the restaurant, and uh, I was sitting there, George Ralph was here, talking, Ronnie Craig was here, John was here, Johnny Nash, and Reggie. And all of a sudden, George Ralph said, I, I was talking about Humphrey Bogart and all that, you know, the, the old stars, Cagney, and we was having a good laugh. And all of a sudden, someone came in and said, oh, Mr. Ralph, the Sinatra had just come in the casino. So we got up, he said, I've got to go, boys, he because Sinatra was just coming. So we all went, OK, lovely. I understand that. And as he walked away, he got about three paces. And he went, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bring him in to meet you guys. I'm sure I'd like to meet you lot. So he said, yeah, I think I said, yeah, sure, Joe, that'd be nice. And all of a sudden, Ronnie Craze leaned across the table, he's grabbed me arm like that, all sensitive, and he's squeezing it. And he went, George, no, no, we don't want to see him. I was mad on And he went, no, no, George, leave it. So he, Ralph went, you sure? And he went, OK. I was what's the matter then, Ronnie? He was squeezing around. He said, Joe, we don't want to see him. He's a flash bastard. We might end up hitting him on the fucking chin. I went, oh, well, he's we'll say that, you know what I mean? But I wanted to meet the answer, you know? Well, I was very friendly with um, Ollie Reed at one time. Ray Winston's my pal, and uh, but obviously Ray wasn't around in that time. Um, Bill Murray was, but Ollie Reed, um, we worked together, me and Ollie, for a long time, and we used to have a gig with him, and we used to go around his house, and it used to be um, he had a sauna bath in there. And he used to call this uh, the Portly Society, and he had a, a brass plaque on his door called the Portly Society. And uh, there was about 12 of us in this Portly Society, mm -hmm. mates, uh, and, and they'd phone up and say, there's a Portly meeting tonight, come in round. So he'd go round there for a drink. And most of the time he'd say, if you went with a suit or whatever you had on, 
after a few drinks, like, it was getting the sauna bath. You mustn't take nothing off. And still we could stand the longest. She, he's just coming out with suits on, ringing, soaking wet, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was a case. He was, he was a good man. I liked him a lot, really. No, I didn't. If, any man, if a man carries a gun for the sake of carrying it and, and don't use, pulls it out and don't use it, he's got to be some fucking idiot, surely. Because uh, if you pull a gun on me, you're going to fight a life out of me, right? And you put it back in your pocket. Well, I know what I've got to do to you tomorrow now, don't I? You know what I mean? All you're doing is telling me what I've got to do. So, any man who pulls that and don't use, he's got to be some sort of idiot. But no, none of my pals used to carry guns. Only time they ever carry guns is when we was going to use it. Not going out for a drink with a shoulder roll on you or something, you know, it's, as for their books, in it, and films. James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart. Nobody carries guns on it. I had a rather a fella in um, Notting Hill. A guy called um, Dookie. What is his name, Dookie? Uh, and uh, I shot him in the leg. But he never went to the law. And that was just a fight. And there's, there's lots of these things that happen in days, you know. I went into a club with my pal Jimmy, Jimmy Nash, Johnny Reed. Um, a fight started with Billy Ambrose, Selwyn Cooney. My pal Jimmy had a fight with Cooney. Jimmy gave him a right hander, broke his nose, and then everybody said, come from out the woodwork. And uh, we was only two or three of us when there was a lot of them. And I don't know what was going on. There was bottles going everywhere and soda siphons. And I heard a couple of bangs. And Cooney was dead. Ambrose had one in his stomach. Oh, and then I got nicked. Who, who pulled the gun? I don't know. I asked Jimmy who pulled the gun. He don't know. I don't know. None of us know. So, who pulled it? I don't know. But um, none of us did. So, all I can say is, I've said it before, he must have stepped in the way of a passing bullet. If we'd have three of us, if we'd have all got found guilty, obviously we would have gone. And I suppose, well, I'd have been well choked by now, wouldn't I? I mean, <laughs> I'd have been well choked. <clears throat> but, yeah, sure. But I can admit, we there was, being so young in them days, I suppose, uh, we didn't, I don't know whether we took the seriousness of it. I mean, because I can remember walking in around the, around the yard, me and Jimmy Nash, and Jimmy, like, is one of the standest guys you'd ever meet. You know what I mean? My partner was. Uh, well, he's still there. He still is. But he, he was fucking mad as a moth, yeah. And we're walking around this yard, and there was this, I remember this screw standing there. And every time we come past this screw, Jimmy said, like, well, keep doing neck exercises, you know, like that. So we're both doing that, you know, like that. And he kept going past, and the screw said, what are you two up to? And Jimmy said, we're doing neck exercises. Right? So he said, what? He said, we're trying to make our neck fat than the red so the rope would go like that. Well, the screw said, you're fucking mad, that's over like, you know? And Jimmy was in this cell, and I was in this one. And Jimmy used to keep sending me in the ring magazine and stuff like that. And he'd make a noose out of a shoelace and put a little noose in the book. And we used to have, like, um, we wasn't allowed to shave ourselves. 
uh, we had this con used to come in and, and shave us, right? So we'd sit down and shave, and when I got up to have a wash at the, at the sink, there's a big mirror along like that. Jimmy be standing there and the wash as well. And I'd look up and Jimmy'd go, like, Ugh. Oh, my fuck, stay here. Down there. And it was a worry, like, you know what I mean? But that's how he was. Looking back on it, you can laugh over it now, you know. <clears throat> and I suppose it's an experience, isn't it? No, it's an experience. I was worried. I was worried when they put me on the pillar. But I remember uh, uh, there was a guy in there, uh, he, he was waiting to get hung, his name was Gypsy Jim Smith. And, and he killed a copper in Plumstead. And uh, got the fill of his car. And he said to me, he said, are you frightened, Joe? And I said, yeah. And he said, always remember, he said, look at that screw, look at him over there, he said, look at your family. He said, everybody's got to die someday. He said, if they ain't, if they sentence us to death, the only difference between us and them would be, we would know how and when. He said, they don't. And you know, I started looking at people, like screws even. Like, I'm thinking to myself, well, oh, what do you wear, are you? You're going to die. The only difference with me is I know how and when. You don't. And I started, you know what I mean? Repeating that to myself. And it, it became an answer to the problem that I had. All you talk about is crime. You learn, you get to know a lot more criminals, you get to know a lot more people. Uh, I don't know so much as you don't learn no more about which, the crime, but what you do learn is um, people and what they're doing, you know what I mean? And you do the same thing. I mean, in them days it was, we was blowing safes up with jelly night. Well, I, I never learned that at school. But you learn that sort of thing in the nick, you know what I mean? How to pack the safe, uh, how to muffle it around and plug it in the light. I mean, switch the light and bang, off it goes. You learn that from other people, with the mouth. Mm -hmm. Did I get any reputation from that pen club? That murder, that pen club, or respect from that? Well, I don't know what, if I got the respect. You see, the people, if somebody else respected me for that, you just got to ask them. I mean, the only thing I got any respect for is because I didn't become a, I, I wasn't a grass. But that's not, you don't get, you don't have entitled to have respect for that. Because if you get nicked with another fella, or you get nicked and the other fella don't, because you don't grass him, it doesn't mean to say you've got to have any respect for it, because you've done what you, what you, you're entitled to do. Doesn't make you a good guy. If someone gets nicked and I don't, he hasn't grasped me up. I don't look at that fellow and say, "What well, a lovely fellow! He didn't grasp me." Well, I wouldn't be with him in the beginning if I thought he was going to grasp. So he's only done what he's entitled to do, what he should do. So I don't think anybody should get any respect because they don't grasp. I would say, grasping is a a terrible, despicable, and people like myself and my friends, who I know, would rather fucking die than be a grass. It's an occupational hazard, isn't it? When you get an eating you know, when you're at it. <clears throat> uh, I'll switch off. Because you've got to forget about your outside world. When you get 14 years, you get a long time. you just got to say, that's it. I'm, I'm now, I'm in another world now. Do you know what I mean? And do your bird. And uh, as I said before, like, you know, you know, you, some people do it brand nose. I was never a brand nose in the fucking neck, you know what I mean? But the screw said, Joe, I say, don't call me Joe. I don't call you fucking Bob, don't call me Joe. You know, and I just get on my bird. I just rather just get on my own, do it on my own, and that's it. And uh, you switch off completely. Like, you've got to say to yourself, well, I'm living another life now, you know what I mean? And once you get in there, and just, 
You've got to forget about going down a pub, ain't you? And having a drink. Forget about your nightlife. There's none of that. No. Just got to get on with it. Go down the gym, start weightlifting, start doing a bit of bag work, start doing... That's it. I've always said you don't get a boxer from Eton College. He doesn't come from any university. Boxers come from normal working class backgrounds. But um, you still like the sport as well. You didn't just go into boxing because you could look after yourself in a fight. I mean, I went into boxing because I loved the game, really. But at the same time, it was to look after yourself as well. But, you know, the fight game, it's, it's just, um, it's in you. But so I bring your blood or it's not. I mean, that's what it is. It's in your blood or it's not there. And uh, it was in my blood from an early age. I, I went on to the um, fairgrounds, travelled with the fairground, boxed with them, or Sam McCummins' booth. I was with them for about... Travelling for about 12 months, um, then I went professional. And I came back and I had 22 fights. And I lost the first one to uh, a fighter called Paul Gormley. And I lost the last one at Wembley to a fighter called Maxi Beach. And he stopped me. That was the, the two out of 22. I lost. I won the others. Then I went into uh, promoting boxing. I was the first man to put a, an unlicensed fight on with Roy Shaw. And um, me and Roy Shaw, we had a few quid out of the game. Roy was solely, he never got involved with like uh, organised people like, and he was a thief on the, on the, as you call it, on the pavement. And he went on a black and got a lot of, he, he got caught, done a lot of stuff, and he got 18 years. He was a hard man, yes, very respected, in them days as well. Yeah, Roy was, yeah. I mean, uh, I can remember the Nicky, he, he broke, um, he broke in two two different prisons, broke the cell door down from inside. That takes him doing, don't it? Roy, before he um, went to prison, he was a middleweight, about 11 stone. I'm not sure if he was a light middleweight or a full-blown middleweight. But let's say approximately 11 stone. Uh, I think he had about a dozen fights. Right, but I know that he won them all in the first, not all knockouts, first or second round. And uh, he was managed by Mickey Duff. Managed him. And uh, I think he fought under the name of Roy West. They wouldn't give him a license in his real name uh, because he'd done some time then. But when he got his 18, coming out then he was, he wouldn't have got a license and his age was against him. Well, during his stay in prison, he put weight on, on the weights and that, he blew right up big, big and strong. And he came out and then it was a question of, uh, didn't even think, there was no such thing as unlicensed. There was no such thing as unaffiliated. Uh, there was just gypsies fighting up at um, Barnet Fair. Roy went up there one day and uh, wanted to fight any gypsy, bare knuckle. When they found out who he was, they said, there's only one man for you, that's Donnie Adams. He's come back and I said, well, let's make him a meal of it. Let's make, put the fight on properly. So we had our own referees. Um, we had our own uh, trainers, seconds, timekeepers. I mean, if you was an ex-fighter, you could be a free to fight. Um, rules. Uh, when we started, I would say there was hardly any rules. I mean, but as show progressed after and after and after, Rules started coming into it, like more rules. Right? But when we started, there was, wasn't a rule at all. 
it all the only rule was you wore gloves. And he stopped boxing when the bell rings. I mean, start when the bell rings. That was all the only rules, really. Um, but as it went on, it progressed into a little bit more Protestantism. Like, um, um, you've got to sell the seats, every way you do. And so there was no license to print money now. And, and Roy had to win. I said, we only, we, only, we only had ideas having the one fight, and that was with Donny Adams. But when Roy bowled him over, it was all over in a matter of seconds. I mean, for, I think the first round of Roy threw went over, and some stone cold. Well, then there was someone else coming along and wants to fight him. Then somebody else came along and wants to fight him, and they kept coming along. Well, I knew the craze from their boxing days, when they was managed by Jack Jordan. And we used to go down the gym in, in uh, just off Warren Street there in Fitzroy Square. And it was Pop Klein's' gym. And then there was the two kids then, they just turned professional. I, I spoke a lot to them then, as kids. And I was trained, I, I was managed by Jack Burns. We all used the same gymnasium. Being twins made a lot of difference. But they were game fuckers, like, and I mean, I mean, I can remember when I was a kid, we'd heard about them uh, running around the East End. It was mainly around their own area. I mean, when they went into a pub once with a couple of swords, a load of doffers, just the two of them, sort of back to back and a load of people with them, with the swords, you know what I mean? So, uh, and it was. The charisma that they set up, uh, always very smart, and being identical twins when they were younger, very much alike, I didn't tell the difference. Uh, but I couldn't tell the difference sometimes. I mean, and, and being you know, it was like, that was the, the charisma they had, very smart, and being the point that they were twins. <clears throat> and and they both thought the same. They were both crazy bastards, you know what I mean? It wasn't just one doing all the villain and one not. I mean, yeah, they're both of them. So when they come at you, they'd come together. Everything they did, they did together. You know, you've seen it, in you? read their books, don't you? It's, it, that was the reputation that came up along with them. And they was dangerous. We never worked for the twins. Everybody thinks that in the twins' time that it was just the craze dominated everything. But they didn't. I mean, lots of people weren't scared of them. We respected the twins. But the people I was with weren't scared of them. I don't think um, John and his family was ever frightened of the, of the craze, never. And they would have matched them any time. And the way we amalgamated, I remember when we had a meeting one day with me and Ronnie Cray. We went and met these Yanks about a deal. And as we were talking, what Ronnie Cray said to me, he said, listen, he said, over here, we match, we'll match your mob any day of the week. In the States, you're the governors. But over here, we're the fucking governors. You know and they accepted that. If Ronnie never liked you, right, and you, they had it, you walked in the bar, you've done something wrong, right, they heard about it. And you walked in the, par, in, the, in the bar where they was, and he walked up to Ronnie, hello Ron, Ronnie was saying, God oh, piss off, go away Gazza, don't want to talk to you, right, get out of my way. Right, he might even throw your right hand there. Now, Reggie would be a different. You walk out of Reggie and say, hello, Reg. He say, hello, guys, how you going? He put his arm around you. What are you doing? Come over and have a chat. And he might go out of the toilet, walk out of the toilet with you. When you go out of the toilet, he might want to snap you. You know what I mean? You knew where you stood with Ronnie Cray. With Reggie, you didn't. You know what I mean? Reggie, Ronnie was so crazy, he would just come out of it there and then. Reggie was 
very, I mean, I could put, hit it, he didn't come out of it, he just, deep, when he was open. I respected him. Um, as you know, I was best man to Ronnie's wedding in Broadmoor. Um, I used to visit Ronnie once a week when he was away in Broadmoor. I liked him. I think Ronnie was a very fair man. <clears throat> uh, they were both gay. But they wasn't gay, this kind of gay, you know what I mean? Uh, they wasn't Kemp. They were just um, gay in a respect that they are young fellas. So, I don't know. I mean, so it's still a gay and it's still queer. <laughs> but but uh, that was them, like, you know what I mean? I never knew him as Jack there. And uh, all I knew him was, was Dennis or Matt. That's how we knew him. He wasn't a slag. He was a very, very staunch guy. I remember Ronnie phoning me up, not once, two or three times, and saying to me, Joe, um, will you tell Matt to shut up? What's he done now? He's going around saying he's going to kill us. And uh, when he sees any of our, our firm in a club, he's walking up and saying, like, oh, you work for the Slay Twins. And uh, have they been up here lately and all that sort of thing, like, you know what I mean? And been taken out the bum lately and all, that, all them nasty things like that to them. Well, that was winding them up, the Twins and Ronnie. I say, all right, I'll talk to him. I say, Mac, Mac, why don't you turn here? You're going round, slagging the twins firm off, telling them all, oh, I was just missed the twins last night. Oh, I was going to shoot them on, wait that side of boozer from them. And they went out the other door. I said, you no know, one day you're going to get here. Oh, I'll go round and shoot them tomorrow. Mac would go round there. And they'd say, yeah, look, man, you know what I'm like. Forget it, you know what I mean? And time and time again, this we're going, I said, mate, they're going to fucking do you one day. Sure enough. Done it. Now, I can't blame them, because if someone's going around saying they're going to kill me, or anybody for that, mate, you've got to do them first, ain't you? If someone's going to do it, you've got to get him first. But they should never have done him the way they did it. He died like a fucking rat, and he shouldn't have died that way. They killed him as if... Here they was Colonel Grass. Everybody in the room jumping on him. That's bullshit. You know, he, 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 had, he was entitled to more respect than to go out that way. Died like a rat and he shouldn't have died that way. Because I would never say he was a um, scum and all that, what I've heard people say on the radio. I mean, no, he was, he was, I had respect for him. But he just got silly Mac did. And if you're going to run around and start saying you're going to do people, then they're going to get you first. He knew, he knew he was going to get it. Maybe it was a death wish he had. But you don't go around doing it. There was Waggy. He was, he, he, he was partners with me and John. And... Uh, he, he had me and Johnny over for a few grand. I mean, and the Billy Hill it was, and he, he fucked us for a few quid. And <coughs> Scott's Jackie had just come out, and then um, Jackie had a row of waggy over it. Sorry. Next thing we knew, Jack Buggy went missing. Well, I saw a funny story there. His mother, or his auntie, but he lived with his auntie, she rang me up. Went round to see her, and she said, uh, Jack hasn't been home for about four days. So I said, oh. She said, well, he wouldn't go out with just a shirt on, not a jacket or nothing, and not come home, and not even phone. So, <clears throat> we heard through gossip that he'd been shot, right? And, uh, but that's all we heard that he'd been shot. Only gossip. We never had no proof. Anyway, one night, she was a spiritualist. 
his auntie, Auntie Meg. And one day she's um, phoned me up, Joe, I want to talk to you. I went round here. And she said, uh, I had a dream last night, Joe. I said, yeah, what was that? She said, he's dead. I said, what? What are you saying? She said, well, I dreamed I saw his hand, his arm sticking out the sea. She said, and I dreamed all I could see was his tattoo on his arm. That's how I knew it was him. She said, it was just sticking out the sea like that. I said, yeah. I said, so, 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 I know he's dead. And you ain't going to plead it. The next day, they found his body in the sea and in peace over. Right? It floated to the top. From the, um, the Navy were doing some manoeuvres. And where he'd been chucked at, someone had shot him and threw him over. His body had come up. Right? Floated to the top. And then it released all the chains like the manoeuvres had. They took her down the morgue and his body was decomposed. Right? So to identify him, they pulled the sheet back and showed her his arm. His tattoo. Is that amazing? Yeah, it's a good stroop. The charge I got 14 years for was making an offer to supply drugs. When Richard Letting was sent to frame me up, he got nicked for a fraud. Uh, about a, what is it, four or five million pound fraud. Right, it didn't come off. So he got arrested for it, and they gave him bail. But I didn't know that whilst he was on bail, he was given bail to to try and get me. You see, so. While he was out on bail, he was like investigating all about me, trying to find out what I'd done and what I hadn't done. And um, one day he came round here, and I had a film company in Pinewood. And I came after after me work, I'd come home and sit down on the chair, and he came round one night about seven o'clock, and I was sitting having something to eat, and he went. Uh, hey Joe, he said, uh, any drugs about? I said, why are you saying that? So he said, well, I've got this fella, he's, he's, he's here and he's got about <clears throat> two or three hundred thousand pounds around him and he wants to buy a load of drugs. So if he know anybody. <clears throat> and I remember, I said, well, that's not my game, so I'm not into that. I'm in the film game, that pine one, you know that. So he said, yeah, but if you know where to get them, so I said, all right, so, um, I'll see what I can do for you. He said, I'm going up in court soon on this fraud charge, and I need the money. If I get the money, I'll jump the bell, because I'm going to get some time. So instead of saying no to him, I said, oh, I'll see what I can do. And it slipped my mind, right? Ten days later, exactly ten days, I had a meeting in my office with John Blake and a few others about a film, film script. <clears throat> I remember, and there was a big ballroom I had there. Uh, they've all left the ballroom, and he came in the office. And he went, hello, Joe. I said, hello, Richard, what are you doing up here? So I just come out to see you. I said, oh, it's, well, I said, but I said, well, come in. Walked into this ballroom, and he sat there right at the end of the table there, and he said, um, you done anything about what I asked you about? I said, what was that? What are you talking about? He said, you know, about the, um, the drugs. I said, drugs? <laughs> oh, yeah, and it took a bit of time this week. <clears throat> and, and like a fucking idiot, instead of saying, oh, I hadn't done nothing, I said, yeah, that, yeah, that's all right, I've seen the fella, and, uh, yeah, I said, how much your man would have paid in? Right? It's just an habit of mine, you know what I mean? Oh, we're on to see a deal. Being a wheeler dealer. <clears throat> and he went, oh, he said he'll pay 38 or 36 or something like grand for a kilo. I went, oh, well, yeah. how many kilos do you want? Oh, he wants um, uh, 40 a week. I said, oh, 40 a week is quite a lot. I said, can you do that, Joe? Oh, I should think so. Yeah, I'll see my man. It shouldn't be a problem. So, like I say, nicked. 
it's all the tape. We're done. <clears throat> when he came here and saw me, asked me about it, he'd gone back to his police friends and said, yes, he's going to get me some drugs. They come along a bug door my office, right? Sent him in, but in court, he said he never knew the office was bugged. A lot of bullshit. Do you know what I mean? Because if he'd have admitted the office was bugged up, it would have been like an agent provocateur. So he said, oh, I never knew the office was bugged. So he walked in there. Once he's asked me that question, they've got it on tape. And I got arrested for making an offer to supply drugs. And, and, and when they said 40 kilos a week, of course it made it like a, a million pound deal, didn't it? Two or three million. And they said 14 years. Just for saying that. The same night, I was laying in my cell, I'm not going to be 14 years, and I turned the radio on, on the news, uh, Coles, the superintendent Coles, he went, he was talking to, to the uh, news people, and he said, yes, we're, we're celebrating now, we're on a drink, and we've got Mr. Pyle, and uh, the streets of London will be a safer place. As if I was running around with an ex or something like that, you know, some lunatic. Why am I double A? Now, the, the books say this, right? that you have, if you have the means uh, and the associates to escape, and if you do escape, you will be a danger to the public. Category double A means you're in a unit, right? In the unit is about, normally is about um, 20 of you. Right? 15 to 20 of you. you. You don't leave that unit. Everything you do is in that small unit. You have a small gymnasium in there. <clears throat> you have your own exercise yard. Follow? And you've got your own wall around the unit. So it's like a prison within a prison. Everything you do is done by a, a, a book. You've got a book with your photograph in it and your name. And if you go from one, one room to another room, to another officer, he takes, takes you with your book. Then he signs it as he hands the book over to that one. Do you know what I mean? Everywhere you go, that book goes with you. That's what on the book means. So you just go buy a book. And uh, you're, you're searched so thoroughly before a visit, after a visit, stripped right off, and stand there bollock naked and you search, put your clothes back on they go through your clothes it's just and when you go to court you've got like helicopter above you escorting you and you've got like about two cars up front two at the back sirens going all the way down straight to the court and they must come back always come back a different way when they leave the court so we don't know the way they're coming back. Well, I was in the unit for about 18 months, two years, all together. Then, uh, then on the first trial, um, they said the jury was crooked. They said that I'd got the jury, or, or some of my friends had, which I knew nothing about. So, they got a retrial, and uh, on the retrial, it's going to be four in. Then I appealed, and then I won the appeal. But the police jumped up, and, said, and the appeal courts slung it out. But the police said, no, we want a retrial. So they gave me a retrial. And then on the third trial, I got found guilty again. But this time, he gave me nine years instead of 14. So that meant I was nearly out. I mean, so I come out then. I don't think there's such a thing as an underworld, you know what I mean? It's just, um... Villains. And, and, and villains, there's no... There's no door you go into and there's another world. 
I suppose you could call it the underworld, but that's more or less for journalists, isn't it? But you would never hear uh, the fellows talking about, oh, we should remember the underworld. <laughs> you, you don't, you wouldn't hear that, would you? So, underworld really is a journalistic word. That's what it is. There's no such thing as underworld, really. Only to the outsider. If I did anything in my life which I thought was wrong, I wouldn't do it. Right? I'll only do in my life what I think is right. And if I think it's right, then I'll do it. But if, if I think it's wrong here, yeah, I won't do it. I'll say, no, fuck that, it's just wrong. Don't do it. But if I think what I'm doing is right, I couldn't care less what any of you people think. Right? I can only, I'd only be concerned with what, what my close friends think, or my family. Uh, but I will only do it if I think it's right, not if it's wrong. So, <clears throat> if I've gone through that through my life, as I said to you, I've gone with the grain in the wood. I don't go against that grain. So, uh, why should I have any remorse? <laughs>